Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. So, John, you and I, uh, the first time we met was at uh, Maker Fair a few years ago here in Ottawa. But uh, I think the first time I, I heard about you was through a podcast that you recorded with uh, Guy English and John Gruber. Uh, that was shortly after the Apple Watch was announced and uh, the three of you had a conversation about watches. And uh, started following you on Twitter shortly after that and found out that you were in the same city as me. And so uh, we met up uh, that Maker Fair when I was uh, when I was showing off some of the things that I do. Yeah, you you towed out a, a Rose engine, which was very impressive. I don't even know how you managed to to get it in there. Uh, it's the first time I'd actually seen a Rose engine in person, uh, and uh, you actually let me try it out, which I really appreciated. It gave me a newfound appreciation for just what it takes to to actually use one of these machines to make primarily what I had known as, as just watch dials. In fact, I had only just finished getting that uh, that Rose Engine operational a few days before Maker Fair, uh, so it was it was still new to me in terms of use. But uh, since then, of course, I've I've done quite a bit of work on it. So let's get a, a bit of backstory. Then, how did you first come to learn about engine turning? Actually, even before that, uh, for listeners who may not even know what engine turning is, entry level, what is what is engine turning? Engine turning is interesting. It's a relatively old technique that few people are familiar with today. It was used a lot in jewelry work starting a few hundred years ago. And the pinnacle was probably at the turn of the last century with the work of Fabergé and Cartier. Now this would be Fabergé and then Fabergé eggs and whatnot, correct? Yes, exactly. And 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 that's what that's the context that most people would know of it today is if you if you think of the imperial uh, you know the Russian East, Easter eggs that the Tsar was giving to his mother and his uh, his wife. Uh, that that's a classic use of of uh, engine turning. The, these engines in the not not in the modern sense of an engine where it's a you know a combustion engine. Uh, the Victorians called anything that was sort of mechanical an engine. Uh, so these are are hand driven, hand powered. Uh, machines that um, that make it easy to engrave and do repetitive patterns on a, on a piece. In the case of a rose engine, you're doing circular work. Uh, in the case of a straight line engine, you're doing uh, straight lines. And so it's it's essentially a way of easily decorating a piece of jewelry or something, uh, you know, a watch or a cigarette case, something like that, with a decorative pattern. And as well as being a decorative pattern, it also helps hide the wear marks of of daily use. Uh, so, you know, a hundred years ago, if, if Johnny Ive was in, you know, designing a watch, he would not have left all the surfaces beautifully smooth and polished. He would have engine turned them to hide all those scratches that we pick up on, uh, on things that are highly polished. Which is patina now, um, on phones and whatnot. Yeah. yeah nowadays uh, that, that shows the use and, you know, sort of the, the individuality of it. Uh, but, you know, 100 years ago, they were also holding on to things a lot longer. A pocket watch was something that you handed down to your your children or your grandchildren. And so you didn't, you it needed to last longer. And, uh, and so one of the ways that you can hide the, you know, sort of those, those marks of daily use is to put a, a an interesting pattern on it, a repetitive pattern that, that hides that. And, and that's one of the, the benefits of engine turning something is that you do hide the, all those little scratches and wear marks of uh, sort of daily use. Just as a small aside, since you brought up Johnny Ive, uh, just for posterity's sake, even though this won't be released uh, until probably quite a while after that. Today, the day of our recording is actually the, the 10th anniversary of the original like, release of the iPhone. So I've been seeing all sorts of iPhones pop up with their aluminum backs all, all scratched up from just years and years of, of daily use. So it's been kind of neat to see that. Yeah, it is interesting to see that. And, and it's... Uh... Again, as, as somebody who designs things that are that are used on a regular basis, and hopefully things that that get used for longer uh, than than what that original iPhone was used for, uh, it's an interesting challenge trying to make something that that you can use regularly and uh, and doesn't end up looking like it's been through the wars after uh, after a year. If you're making a, making a pen or or a watch or something that's that you want to last for. 500 years. You don't want it to look like it's been tumbled through a, uh, you know, a sand mixer or something like that for, for a couple of hours. You want it to, to look relatively clean and unblemished for as long as possible. Mm. Now you mentioned pens there. You are well known for your pen making abilities and you make some stunning pens. 
Uh, it's really beautiful, really well crafted pens that literally really could and more than likely will last for for hundreds of years. How did how did that come about? I've been a pen user most of my life. Uh, I started writing with with fountain pens exclusively in high school. My uh, my hands would cramp badly during exams and you know writing long essays when I was re- writing with a, a ballpoint pen, and uh, so my mom. Uh, gave me her fountain pen that she wrote with in school, and that helped a lot. That that made made it so that I could actually write for hours on end and not have to uh, you know not have hand cramps. Uh, something most people don't realize about uh, the difference between fountain pens and ballpoint pens. Uh, fountain pens you don't have to put pressure on the pen to to have it write properly. Uh, with a ballpoint pen, you actually have to put pressure on the pen to make the ball roll to then deliver ink to the uh, to the page. But a good fountain pen will leave a leave a line without any pressure at all. So that that's how I began using a fountain pen, and it wasn't for quite a while until I I started making them. Uh, but I realized that uh, I couldn't really afford the pens that I wanted. I, I was seeing these gorgeous gorgeous pens that uh, that I couldn't afford. Also, I I tend to I, I prefer a heavier pen, something that's a bit larger than the average person does. The other thing I realized was that most people who are making larger pens they didn't have a very good design sense. The The pens were poorly designed. Uh, they figured that just because uh, you know it's bigger people using them or ha- people with bigger hands using them, that they didn't need to pay as much attention to things like balance and comfort when you're writing with it. But uh, it's still important. And if you're all the pens that I design, I, I want them to be usable because I, I use them. Uh, these are all pens that I want to write with and that I do write with on a regular basis. So uh, I, I sort of approached it from the point of view of this is this is something that I want to do better. So that's that's really how I got into making the pens that I do. For my own curiosity, because uh, I'm not uh, a pen connoisseur, what, what do you consider to be a, a well-balanced pen? I'm more familiar with this in, in terms of knives and things like that. What do you look for in a, in a pen that's well-balanced? Well, in the case of a fountain pen, there, there are a few different ways that you can use a pen. Uh, a lot of the 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 vintage pens that are out there, they tend to be smaller pens. And so they need to be used uh, with the cap posted on the back of the barrel. And that gives the pen enough length to be able to comfortably hold it in your hand. If you imagine holding something, let, let, let's say you've got like the stub of a pencil uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't go past, you know, sort of where the web of your, your thumb and, and index finger meet it's very uncomfortable to write with that. You know, you try writing with that for a long time. It's, it's, it's very uncomfortable. Whereas a pencil that's longer that, that sticks up past your hand is far more comfortable. So with a lot of the, uh, the vintage pens, they were shorter in length. And so to make them they sort of extend them out to a length that was uh, comfortable, you needed to post that cap. The first thing that you have to realize is how, how long is that pen? Is it going to be comfortable in your hand with just the barrel of the pen? Or is it something that you're going to have to post the cap as well to get it to a length that's comfortable to write with? Now, I make pens that don't post. The caps tend to be too heavy. And so if you try and post the caps on my pens, uh, the pen tends to jackknife up off of the paper a little bit. And it's it's uncomfortable to write with. Instead, I weigh the, weigh the, the barrel of the pen forward slightly. So it tips, tips forward towards the paper. And that makes it a bit easier to write with and a bit more comfortable. All you need to do is guide the pen. You don't need to apply any pressure to the paper at all for it to write properly. All right. So you said that your the first film pen you got was from your your mom. Do you remember what make of pen that was? Uh, it was a Schaefer, and I don't remember which Schaefer it was now. Unfortunately, uh, somebody walked off with that pen years later. I know one of the next pens I had was a Parker sonnet that my grandmother bought for me. Those were those were really inappropriate for me. My my hands are relatively large and they were on the small side, so they were they were a bit uncomfortable as I found out later on compared to other pens, but they were what I knew and they were better than the ballpoint pens that were out there. Now you mentioned too that around that time there were other pens you'd sort of set your sights on uh, but were kind of out of your range in terms of what you you could afford. What what grail pens did you have or, or do you have? Well, it's funny. Later, it wasn't until quite a few years later when I started diving into the pen world because what most people don't realize is that there is this deep, dark underworld of pens that, uh, uh, you know, most people, they think about a pen and they, they think about going down to uh, down to Staples or, you know, finding a, 
finding relatively inexpensive pens, but if you start digging into magazines like Pen World, you'll find that there's a quite a quite a large industry of of higher end pens out there. Uh, so I, I guess at the time, a lot of the um, some of the pens I was looking at were made by let's say David Oscarson or Yardo Lead, for instance, and and they were doing higher end pens that are more like jewelry. Uh, you know, they're 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 decorative. They're also functional. And, uh, and those, those were starting to attract my attention. And part of what was attracting me to those pens was that they, they were larger pens. They were more appropriate for my hands and they looked great as well. What sort of materials were, were they made from those pens? Like the David Oscarsons? They're making, they're being made out of precious, uh, precious metals. So they were being made out of silver. Uh, they're made being made out of gold. Some of them had enamel on them. Some of them were being engine turned. Some of them were being engraved, and and so they they really represented uh, more of the aesthetic that I was interested in as well. Uh, I was making jewelry by this time, and and so I was intrigued by what other people were doing, and uh, and certainly were were of interest to me. So it was the the jewelry making that came first, not the the pen making. Yeah, it did. The um, jewelry making came, I guess, around the turn of the century. I was I was living in Toronto at the time and and in the IT world full time, and I, I was getting very frustrated. I was working on virtual computers. I was working on machines located around the world, and you know, it wasn't very satisfying because nothing that I was working on was tangible, and and none of it was was sort of built to last. It was all being designed to to be replaced on a regular basis. So uh, a friend of mine was a jeweler and and she started teaching me in sort of evenings and weekends how to how to do basic bench jewelry work. You know, simple things, making necklaces, making rings, making brooches, uh, all all the classic things that a that a bench jeweler would learn how to do. And um as I as I got more and more into the pen world, I realized that you know, I could translate those skills as a jeweler into making pens, and that's when I started. That's when I started moving over into into the pen world, and and of course I began with the the same way that a lot of pen makers do, and and I bought uh, the inexpensive pen kits that you can get from places like Lee Valley, and started turning basic pens out of wood and acrylic, and then from there quickly started making completely custom pens. So I guess within, I'd say probably within six months of turning my first pen, uh, which was made entirely from a kit, uh, I had built a pen completely from scratch. And the only thing that I was purchasing from anybody else was the, uh, the nib itself, everything else, the, uh, the, the body, the, you know, the barrel, the section, the cap, all of that, the clips, those were all things that I was making myself. Yeah, that's that's how I got started. Was was making these pen kits, but then that that wasn't very satisfying to me. And again, one of the, you know, we talked about uh, about design and balance and how a pen feels when you're writing with it. And one of the biggest problems with those kit pens is that they're very poorly balanced. They're they're not really well designed. Uh, they're designed to be made easily and assembled easily, but that leaves something to be desired when it comes to the actual function of the pen. And so they're they tend to be they tend to be very poorly balanced is the biggest problem with them, and also you're very limited in terms of the diameters that you can make the pen. Uh, they're designed to work within a certain range of size, and um, and so that's that's a very limiting factor with them. So it wasn't it wasn't very long before I I knew that I a I was interested in making pens, and b that that these kit pens were not going to were not going to satisfy me. I needed to get into something, uh, something more custom than that. So how did it feel to finally see a, a pen of your own design come together for the very first time? I, it, it was satisfying. It was, it was incredibly challenging though. It, it took, uh, it, it took a long time to get something that I was happy with. Uh, of course, one of the problems when you're, when you're designing something, and I, and I think this is something a lot of people don't realize it's, it's easy to look at a, at something that that's been designed and say, oh, this isn't quite right and that isn't quite right, but it's it's more challenging when you're making it to say, okay, this isn't quite right, but how do I fix it? How do I make it better? And so some of my early pens were horrible. They were, you know, they're much too large, or they were they were too long, or they were too short, and uh, and so it wasn't. Uh, it took a while before I had something that I was happy with, and. And same thing with uh, with with little things like the threads that it t- that connect the cap to the barrel. 
a lot of people don't realize just what's involved with making a, a thread that closes quickly so that you're not sitting there screwing your cap on for six or seven turns to get the cap to close. You need something that'll close, close quickly. So it, t- it took a while to design threads that, that I was happy with that would close properly and that I could make consistently. And, and uh, yeah, I, I remember the first, the f- that, that first pen that I did, that first custom pen I did, I designed the barrel and the section first. Uh, the section for people who don't know is the, the, the part at the front of the pen where you hold on to, just behind where the nib is. And, uh, and so I had cut these threads, um, on the, on the barrel and, uh, and I loved it. I loved the shape of the pen. It was, um, it was, it was great. It was very comfortable. And then I think it took me another two months to be able to make a cap that actually fit the pen properly, uh, just to, just to get the, the threads working properly and the, and the size of it. And, uh, it was, um, it was a frustrating process, but it was, uh, at the end of it, it's extremely satisfying to have something that you've made sitting there in your hands and you can say to somebody, hey, this is this is something that I made and I designed from, from scratch. Mm. So this was all in silver? No, this was in acrylic. I, I didn't, uh, you know, prototyping, especially when you're uh, when you're making a lot of mistakes early on, uh, you, you want to work in, uh, in as inexpensive a material as possible. So, uh, so yeah, I was working in acrylic at the time. And, uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't until later that year that I started working in, uh, working in, in silver and, and doing that. Cause that, that of course brought its own challenges and, and difficulties. The clips were still being made, uh, even on those early acrylic pens, the clips were being made out of silver. The bodies themselves, the caps themselves, those weren't, those were being, uh, those were being made out of acrylic. Now the, the company that you produce your pens under is called Silver Hand. Where did that name come about? The name came out of the fact that I was making things with my hands out of silver and they were being made to be used by someone's hand. So basically a, a play on, on those two ideas. When did you first introduce engine turning into your, your pen making? Uh, engine turning was there very early on. Uh, the, the clips that I was making early on were, um, were sort of a flat clip made out of sheet metal, uh, made out of sheet silver. And the faces of those were engine turned. And so, you know, it was very simple. It was just a very basic, um, you know, straight line pattern that went up the clips. But it was there very from the very beginning. And um, the first silver pens that I was making were were entirely engine turned. And then eventually I went on to making some which, uh, which had enamel on them as well over top of the engine turning. And since then, I've, I've moved on to being able to do work in... Um, in other mediums as well. So there's a range of different products and not all of them have engine turning on them now, but uh, certainly engine turning is always something that it, that'll always be at the heart of what I do just because it's, uh, it's fascinated me for, for the longest time. So what was your first hands-on experience with, with an engine? Uh, first experience was at um, an OTI symposium. The OTI is a uh, ornamental turners international and they're a group of enthusiasts in North America as well as a few professionals uh, who are trying to maintain these these antique engines and maintain the art of not just engine turning but also ornamental turning, which is sort of the the bigger brother of uh, engine turning. Uh, these these engines that we use now for engine turning they originally started as um, as ornamental lathes for doing decorative work. Uh, so we most people are familiar with the idea of a lathe where you're you're spinning something uh, around on its axis, and then you're turning it, and so you get um, you know you get symmetrical shapes um, around that that long axis. Ornamental engines were designed to be able to do odd things with that. So instead of just turning, you know, a simple a simple cylinder, you can offset that you know that part, or you can index it and do things. Uh, some of the earliest examples of those are um, the Coburg ivories, which are in one of the palaces of the Medici in, in Florence, and just absolutely stunning work. Um, just incredible what you can do with these with these engines. And eventually, uh, people moved on from turning ivory and um, and wood, and realized that they could start engraving metal. And, um, and that's where the, the engine turning sort of grew out of that. So Ornamental Turners International, uh, they, you know, they're sort of a group of enthusiasts who, who get together regularly. Uh, I went down to their symposium. I had found out about them 
Uh, I don't remember how I how I came across them, but I I had been doing research into engine turning for quite a few years at that point. So this is 2006 that I I go down to St. Louis to the uh, the OTI symposium that was there, and uh, and I had never seen one of these engines in person, and I know had no idea how they were working. Uh, I had a book by a gentleman named Martin Matthews. He a fascinating gentleman who uh, from the UK. Uh, he was the fifth generation of his family who made watch cases by hand. And in the uh, the eighties, I believe it was, he wrote a book called Engine Turning, and it was a bit of a history as well as a bit of a you know introduction, saying this is this is a you know sort of line drawings of what these engines look like, and these are the patterns that they make. And I I remember spending hours going over these these line drawings and trying to figure out how these engines worked, and and it wasn't it wasn't particularly obvious how they were how they were working, and so. Uh, the first time I, I actually was able to see some of these engines in in motion was uh, was at this symposium in 2006. From there, I I quickly realized that I I needed to to own one of these engines and start working. And um, I was fortunate through uh, a gentleman in the UK by the name of John Edwards as well. Coincidentally, yeah, this John Edwards was uh, in the UK and was the president of the Society of Ornamental Turners there at the time. He arranged. Uh, the purchase of an engine, a straight line engine that was uh, that had been living in a uh, jeweler's shop in Birmingham, and this jeweler was retiring and closing up and selling off his shop, and so uh, John was was tasked with finding a buyer for it, and so I uh, I bought this eleven hundred pound straight line engine from England and had it shipped over here. It had been sitting in the shop for years and wasn't particularly good shape and spent uh, spent a lot of time restoring it and getting it back up and working and then uh, and then was able to to start working on it impressive now an interesting bit of, of common history there about the same time you were heading down to st louis for the the oti symposium uh, i had actually just heard about matthews at the same time and he actually uh following his video uh, he inspired me to make my very first watch case uh, which was not the most successful thing, as, as your early pens uh, were. Uh, but I uh, certainly learned uh, a lot from him. And I was so impressed by the the breadth uh, of knowledge and experience that he, that he has. Yeah, Martin was fascinating. And, and I've, I have I never had a chance to uh, to meet him, unfortunately. He he passed away a few years ago. I, I know a few a few people who, who were friends of his. And... Uh, he just had a an incredible breadth of knowledge and uh, and watching him work those those videos anyone who hasn't seen them it, it's worthwhile finding copies of those videos and and seeing them it's uh it's remarkable watching him work and uh how sure he is of of what he's doing and not using modern uh, measuring devices and ending up with a case that that fits perfectly with this uh, this watch that he's designing uh, he also did do a video on on engine turning as well and uh, and that was that was quite fascinating. I didn't find either of those until after uh, that OTI symposium, but uh, I had seen the uh, I'd seen his book, and that was uh, that was what what fascinated, or that's what sort of got me into figuring out what I needed to to buy to um, to to start engine turning. I came into it. I, I became aware of engine turning, I guess, the way that most people do through you know, Fabergé eggs and seeing that the work that Fabergé was doing. But it's funny because I, I remember my first experience with a Fabergé egg wasn't really Fabergé egg. It was, it was uh, one that was made for the James Bond film Octopussy. And those were not real Fabergé eggs. Like they weren't original Fabergé eggs, uh, but were in fact made specifically for the movie uh, by, uh, by a gentleman by the name of uh, Jim Miller in the UK, uh, whom I've since sort of spoken to and, and chatted with, but he made those specifically for the movie. And, um, it, it's, it's stuck in my mind as, as being fascinating. This, this fact that somebody could make something that was, you know, that was so valuable and was, was, uh, was so beautiful. And so I, later on, as I started making jewelry, I, I thought back to those, you know, the images of, of the movie and, and also of the, of the real Fabergé eggs that were out there. And, uh, wanted to learn how they were made. I was I was fascinated with the idea of these of how these patterns were being made and and the enameling. So that's uh that's sort of why I became fascinated enough to then find Matthew's book on 
on engine turning and then that sort of led me to OTI and then of course you know now that's uh why I do the, you know why I engine turn the things that I do is is sort of through that line of uh of work starting from that you know as a as a child seeing that those images in uh you know in a movie interesting now, I actually had no idea that uh Fabergé had employed engine turning on the rigs uh until I met you. I learned that from you. Uh, my first introduction was actually through the work of George Daniels. Uh, he was the most prolific watchmaker of the last century. Um, and the work that he did with engine turning and then by extension, uh, his apprentice, uh, Roger Smith. And then, of course, a slew of, of high-end watch brands like Breguet and, and Vacheron Constantine and, and brands like that that uh, have watches that feature engine turning on them as well. Yeah, I had known Fabergé primarily for... the. the the enamel work and some of the, the fine engraving, or I guess you would almost call it carving uh, in metal that they do. Yeah, the the watch world is certainly certainly is the the industry that's that has continued using it for the longest. It was they were certainly one of the first adopters of engine turning early on. Uh, Breguet was uh, famously was was using engine turning on his dials and on his cases, and uh, and using it not just as a decorative element. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, not just sorry, not just as a, an element to hide scratches and and daily use, but also as a decorative element on the dials. Uh, so you look at a lot of the the current um, watches from people like Roger Smith or Breguet, the modern company, and you can see the direct lineage back to those those watch dials. And kind of looking ahead a little bit, I don't know if this is anything you uh, want to talk about or not, but you've actually uh, enrolled in uh, the British Horological Institute's correspondence course on, on watchmaking and repair. What are, your, what are your future aspirations there? Yeah, so it's interesting. My, my love of mechanical devices um, predates my interest in jewelry making or, uh, or pens, for that matter. Uh, when I was, uh, I was fortunate as a, as a child, my, my family was, was primarily in the UK, and, and we would go back over to visit on a regular basis, primarily at Christmas. And I had a, a, a cousin who was maybe 15 years older than me, uh, Richard, who who was a collector of of clocks and watches. He he and his friends would often buy up antiques from an estate sale, and then they would split them amongst them. And you know, one one guy was was interested in in silverware, another was interested in in furniture, and and Richard was interested in clocks primarily. And and so he would repair them, and and he would then resell them. And I remember staying in his bedroom as a child and, uh, you know, these dozens of clocks that were in various states of disrepair and, and functioning and, and being fascinated with the workings of these, of these, um, these little machines. And so one of the things I've always been fascinated with was, was the idea of making a watch. And uh, so, as you mentioned recently, I've started going down that road of, of teaching myself watchmaking and, and trying to... Uh, Trying to learn a little bit more about how how all of the components are made, so that I can, in some cases, just repair the ones that I've got because I do have some some old watches that need repair. But also, uh, I'm hoping to be able to make one from scratch at some point, and um, and and be able to make my own watch. Now, whether that becomes uh, another part of the brand and whether that's something that I do on a regular basis or not, we'll have to see. I, I may finish my first watch and think there's no way I'm making another one of these. Uh, or I may also, you know, start doing, start doing more of them. So I'm, 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 I'm interested in where that's going. It's, uh, if nothing else, I'm, I'm curious about the, you know, about how these things are made and, and, uh, how they function. So that, that curiosity is really what's, uh, what's driving me towards that. Hmm. Well, having seen your, your studio for the first time, just a few weeks ago, uh, you're certainly well equipped, uh, to take this on. So I look forward to seeing what comes of it. Yeah. yeah, it should be interesting. It's uh, it's a fascinating journey so far, and it's uh, far more challenging than anything else I've done, which is which is also driving me towards it. I I, I love that challenge of 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 learning new things and and of uh, trying to trying to figure these things out. It's um, it's it's really what what's driven me through through most of my career. Uh, you'll see most most the average person who looks at my work won't necessarily realize that um, that a lot of the things that I do are very uh, very experimental and have not not necessarily in terms of pushing the limits of new techniques or new um, new materials, but experimental in that I'm 
often using techniques that people haven't used for a long time. And so I'm rediscovering some of the things, you know, some of these, uh, these materials and some of these techniques like engine turning. Uh, there certainly are people today who are, who are doing engine turning work, but not a lot of them. And there aren't a lot of people who are writing about it. So, you know, I, I bought this engine from the UK and when it, when it arrived, of course, it was in pieces and heavily rusted and some parts were missing. And so the first thing I had to do was, was figure out how this engine was supposed to work and then reassemble it and restore it. And then I had this, this engine that I had spent, you know, 120 hours restoring and I had no idea how to use it. There, there were no manuals for it. There were no descriptions on how to actually use this thing. So I then spent uh, the next six months uh, engine turning and learning how, how engine turning worked and how to, how to uh, make the cutters that I needed for the engine turning work and the engraving and, and the pattern bars and things like that. So, uh, and that, and that's just one of, of many things that I do that where I've had to sort of try and rediscover how to do it. And, uh, and so that's what I find remarkable about the, the, the watch world is again, having these, you know, these techniques that not a lot of people know about and not a, lead, not a lot of people talk about. And so trying to teach myself them and, and try and sort of learn them again. I've, I've caught one of your, your talks before, and I know you've given a number of other talks on uh, sort of esoteric or, or somewhat lost uh, arts and lost knowledge, or, or certainly information that's not widely available anymore. And uh, the, the information that you, you provide through the experiments that, that you have done is, is fascinating. And uh, hopefully that's some stuff that we can uh, dig into a little deeper in uh, future episodes. Yeah, absolutely. It's I I love talking about it. I as you know, I I recently uh spoke at a at a jewelers conference in um Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh the Santa Fe Symposium is geared towards jewelers and uh so I was speaking about an old technique that not a lot of people are are doing anymore, not a lot of modern jewelers are doing anymore. And uh so I'm I'm sure we're going to get to that in another episode. We don't need to uh to go into that now, but I think it's important to try and make sure that these old techniques don't die out. Uh, there's a there's a place in in modern design and modern jewelry work for old techniques. I don't think it's worthwhile being slaves to the original use of these techniques. You know, I think that uh, some of the modern engine turning, for instance, when you look at the work that uh, Vacheron Constantine, for instance, is doing with some of their uh, their métier d'art watch dials are absolutely fabulous, and they're they're intentionally not doing what other people have done. Um, a friend of mine, Rich Littlestone, he's a pen maker as well. Uh, based out of uh, Denver, Colorado, he's intentionally not using the traditional pattern bars that that everyone else has been using, and so his engine turning designs are fabulous. They're they're so different than what uh, than what the rest of us are doing, just because he's he's intentionally moved away from those classic designs. So I, I think it's important to revive these these old techniques, these old arts, and and figure out how to use them in a in a modern you know in a modern design sense. What did you study in university? Just out of curiosity. I left. Uh, I left my university degree. Uh, I guess a year into it, um, I started a, a human kinetics degree at Ottawa University, and studying the human body and the way that the body worked, and and studying it from the point of view of uh, athletics primarily. Uh, at the time, I was um, competing as a triathlete, and had been a, a competitive swimmer as well prior to that and uh, as well as a, a runner in high school. And so I, I was fascinated with the human body and how it functioned. I mean, really treating it exactly like I am any of the machines that I, that I work on now. It's, it was a, you know, it's a fascinating machine to me. So I was, uh, I was doing that. I was also doing IT work as well at the same time and, and realized very quickly that despite the fact that I was interested in the, in the human body, I, I, there was never a, a successful career there. You know, there was never a lot of money in, in doing that. And so, uh, the IT world sort of took over because I was able to make a, a good living off of it, even though I had no education in it. Uh, so yeah, I've, I really have, uh, have very little formal education in anything. It's, you know, I've got a high school education and, uh, and a little bit of a university degree and, and everything else I've, I've taught myself along the way. A true polymath and autodidact. Autodidactism is is one of those things that a lot of people don't really uh, don't really know about. Um, I think uh, famously Adam Savage from MythBusters talks about it in uh, in his videos and and really it's it's that um, that drive to teach yourself things and and I'm quite fortunate that I'm able to I'm able to sit down and and look at a thing and and start to teach myself you know that that thing if I'm interested in it. 
And it's, you know, it's, it's sometimes a struggle and it takes a long time, but a big part of it is just realizing that if it's a thing that somebody has learned, then you can learn it. And so that's, that's sort of how I treat the world is, is I look at the, the world and see the, you know, sort of the interesting things that are out there and say, hey, I want to make that. How do I do it? I, I spend a lot of sleepless nights uh, reading up on things, but it's, uh, that's also the reason why I'm, I make the things that I do. Oh, fantastic. It's been nice getting to know you a little better, Chris. Thanks for listening to Off Hours. You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop, and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Silver underscore hand. <laughs>